Humanity is growing incessantly. There are almost 10,000 new additions to the human race every hour. Today, we have already reached seven and a half billion. Of these, more than half already live in cities, thus making living space more scarce and more expensive. The UN estimates that the world's population will grow by a further third by the year 2050. But where and how are all of these people to live? Experts, architects, and city planners all over the world are working on solutions to the increasing shortage of space and urbanization. New ideas are being sought to make life in the cities affordable and worth living in again. One model for the future builds on the idea of so-called shared spaces with cluster apartments. But what exactly does this mean? Cluster apartments are a cross between shared flats and ultra-small apartments as in this complex, which opens in November 2018. On the one hand, there are self-contained rooms with a small bathroom and kitchenette, supplemented on the other hand by additional large communal living areas. In shared spaces, we have spaces for the community, so where everybody can go and can use the spaces, like a lounge, like a fitness room, and also a rent kitchen, where you can rent the kitchen for a party or whatever. And uh, also we have the apartments where you can be for yourself. Many of the new micro apartments already make use of the possibilities offered by digitalization. That digitalization and urbanization go hand in hand can also be seen in the affected sectors, such as the construction and furniture industries. More and more interior design concepts orient themselves on the trend of the smart home, an intelligently networked home where automatically controlled roller shutters and lighting are just the beginning. In future, the smart home will also be able to register when a person falls and contact the emergency services independently. We placed a lot of value on ensuring that the system we offer can be retrofitted and can also be used in rented properties. We use the power infrastructure there and transmit the signal of each individual sensor per radio. But even though design and technology are merging together more and more, the massive influx of new city dwellers remains one of the most important topics. Around the year 1900, only roughly 10% of the world's population lived in cities. This figure has now risen to 50%. By 2050, it will be almost 70%. And each and every one of them will want a roof over their head. Current studies conducted by Köln Messe confirm this. Young people are attracted to the urban centers, some older people too, who don't want to miss out on the conveniences, as well as the cultural, economic and social amenities that a city can offer. So space must be dealt with economically. Micro-apartments are part of this. In addition to the concept of particularly small, some city planners are also having a shot at the goal particularly big. Building upwards began at the end of the 19th century, and the age of the modern high-rise began with the invention of steel frame construction and the electric elevator. The current record holder stands in Dubai. The Burj Khalifa measures an impressive 828 meters and the breakthrough of the magical one kilometer limit would appear to be merely a matter of time. These giant structures cannot solve the problem of urban space shortage either, however, because the construction and maintenance costs of these skyscrapers are enormous too. Objects of this kind therefore serve prestige purposes more than anything else. As there are limits to vertical and horizontal construction, another model is asserting itself in many places compression. Additionally required living space is acquired here by adding stories to existing buildings and skillfully utilizing construction gaps. In this instance, an architect has radically implemented this idea. The house, which was built in a construction gap, is only three and a half meters wide, but still offers 75 square meters of floor space spread over five floors. Many people, including Czech designer Lucy Koldova, are dealing with the question of how living quality of the highest possible standard can be achieved in compact areas. Her special theme is the psychology of light, properly applied, 
lighting can have a great influence on a person's feeling of well-being and performance capacity. The concept is that no matter whether in the kitchen or the study, every room should be given its own individual light coloring and design. I divided uh, the rooms into different uh, zones so that you can experience every time different moods and different atmosphere. And in my opinion, light should follow uh, the atmosphere you would like to reach. And you should be able to enjoy light uh, in a different way by each activity you do at home. How big should living space ultimately be for a person to enjoy a good life? And is bigger really always better? The fact is that people are continuing to move to the large urban conurbations, while the makeup of the population is changing at the same time, with more and more one- and two-person households. Although these trends pose great challenges for the housing of the future, they also offer many opportunities, because they make fundamental changes to the forms and possibilities of how we live together. $89.3 billion U.S. dollars was spent on kitchens worldwide in 2017, with this figure likely to rise. The kitchen has long since become a status symbol and often forms the focal point of people's homes. It's living space in its living room. It's not just about cooking, preparing and tidying away. It also involves quite naturally producing a really cozy atmosphere over dinner in a kitchen with beautiful lighting. In this regard, the kitchen really has become a part of people's living space and not merely a room with a collection of furniture. Tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are, said French author Brian Savarin many years ago. That this is not necessarily true anymore can be seen from a recent study conducted by global delivery service Deliveroo. It evaluated the orders of 10,000 partner restaurants all over the world and produced some astonishing results. The favorite dish of the French in Paris, for example, is spaghetti bolognese. Whereas the tradition-conscious Romans prefer to have a burger rather than a pizza on their plate. And the number one spot in Sydney goes to the chicken burger. So an amazing amount of international dishes are also cooked in the great cities of the world, even in home kitchens. In her Elements Kitchen, Zara Henke demonstrates that Asian aromas can also reach five-star level. She was born in Seoul, abandoned as a baby on the streets of the city, and adopted as a child into a German family. She visited her home country for the first time and set out in search of her roots. The book project has, of course, been a really big and emotional one, traveling around for two weeks with a photographer and having a look at many different towns and cities, getting to know all the different cooking styles. Above all, traditional Korean cuisine and a chunk of the country of my birth was understandably very emotional at times and also tremendously interesting and inspirational for me. And my cooking and the restaurant here. Stories that inspire hobby cooks all over the world. Recent studies show that 45% of hobby cooks are inspired by the star chefs. Argentinians, Chinese, and Turks are most in love with their kitchen idols. This enthusiasm for cooking causes a lot of stress all over the globe too, however. 59% of people feel under pressure when hosting a dinner. Russian and Dutch people are the most relaxed here when faced with this challenge, whereas the Chinese feel the most pressure as hosts. So what does it look like now, the kitchen of the future? Whereas hobby cooks strive to copy their idols in their private culinary temples, many people lack the time and leisure that cooking requires. That is why electrical goods manufacturers are looking for innovative solutions to make things easier for hobby cooks. You don't need any cooking know-how to be able to use this. With our smart home application, you can just search for the recipe that you like, choose a recipe, follow the instructions, very easy, and the oven does all the think work. This raises the question as to whether food will soon cook by itself or be prepared by robots with artificial intelligence. 
Ich glaube, das ist sehr zwiegespalten. Also einerseits sage ich auf jeden Fall. I think there are two very different ways of looking at it. I would definitely say on the one hand that people are still needed to cook truly exceptional dishes, the personality of the people who vouch for their products, the people who process the products and really understand and care about them. On the other hand though, I believe that because of the many difficulties that gastronomy has to contend with, not enough trained personnel, compliance with working hours, etc., that some machines will definitely replace some kitchen workers sooner or later. Smart home is the new trend here, the kitchen of the future where people can check what is still in the fridge while they're out shopping. There are many different solutions which make cooking easier in many places. A completely new feature is the integration of the hob into the worktop to form a single surface. The benefits of a TPV is that uh, it's much more efficient than any other induction in the market. Um, number one, because we elevate the pans, uh, so you have 50% less residual heat going to the surface. That means that it's warm to the touch, but it doesn't burn. It's also a scratch-resistant surface. So perhaps you can chop and cook, and it's a much more practical product. Technology temples on the one hand an increasing awareness of and demand for sustainability on the other. 52% of people take sustainability into account when shopping or making investments. The topic of livability plays an essential role in the kitchen. A room to live, work and relax in, or simply put, living space, which plays such a dominant role in the kitchen design of today and tomorrow. This trend is certain to increase rather than decrease. Combined with state-of-the-art electric appliances, the kitchen becomes a mixture of high-tech, emotion and sensual experience. So people of all nations cook with great passion and orient themselves on their own great role models from top-class gastronomy. No wonder then that even the big industrial trade fairs for kitchens, such as the Living Kitchen in Cologne, have the character of a great consumer event. There are lots of chefs here. I just discovered Johang Lava. There's a whole lot more hiding around in the kitchen somewhere cooking and sizzling. It's quite simply a wonderful meeting of people from the same line of business. No matter whether it's sustainable natural wood kitchen or a technology temple in future design, the kitchen of tomorrow will be planned with the greatest of care when the fittings and furniture are installed. People in Germany spend an average of 6,281 euros on a new kitchen. But they often prefer to save for a new luxury kitchen than for an expensive car. Worldwide, the growth rate for kitchens costing between 25,000 and 100,000 euros is around 30%. The important thing is that cooking and eating together are a basic pleasure, which make people happy in all of the continents of the world. population is growing with every second that passes. Over 7.6 billion people currently inhabit planet Earth. The countries with the biggest populations in 2018 were China with 1.4 billion, followed by India with 1.33 billion, and the USA where 328 million people currently live. And all of the people all over the world have one thing in common. They all want to live in their own dream home. But a genuine home can only be created through individual fittings and furnishings. We are living, I believe, in an era where individuality is an absolute megatrend. The customers of today strive for self-realization and more than anything else, their own four walls are predestined to reflect people's preferences and individual taste. The use of building materials runs through the entire course of human history. Stone, along with wood, is one of the oldest natural building materials in existence. Ceramics, metals, glass and plastics supplement the materials from which furniture is made. These are the materials from which dream homes are made. With a market volume of 235 million euros in 2019, the biggest turnover is generated in the USA, followed by the UK with 76 million and Germany with 55 million euros. 
In those without saying that the world of materials includes lacquers, be it high gloss paint or soft varnish, as well as more specialized themes, such as metal or real cement surfaces. Then, of course, there is glass, which is still a wonderful design element, and now real wood, too, at a reasonable price. Furniture made of wood is still an indestructible classic in the furniture industry, which has been celebrating a comeback in recent years. Attributes such as durability, uniqueness, health, and living quality are representative of solid wood furniture. The decisive aspects of this material are its value retention, natural radiance, and sustainability. There is this feeling of reconnecting with the original, with the deep desire in today's society, where there is so much technology and so many technical materials in the market. People can feel comforted, protected, or look for security and warmth. Wooden furniture is to be found all over Europe these days in almost all rooms. In Ireland, a good 90% of all bedrooms have furniture made from this natural material. In Poland, on the other hand, 80% of all fittings and furnishings in dining and living rooms are made of wood. An awareness of the finite properties of the raw materials is setting in with all consumers. I do feel that um, the user, the young generation, the, the consumer in a way, they also asking about recycling products or recycling materials. The people are critical nowadays and the uh, young generation are critical. They don't want to have as much product as possible. Metal furniture is also making big advances in the popularity ratings, however. There has been great demand in this regard for quite some time now for furniture with an industrial flair, with focus on metal, often in combination with solid wood. On top of this, the combination with other materials, such as wood or plastic, help to offset its cool and sterile look. It is especially the combination of metal, wood, leather or fabric which is extraordinarily popular with young designers that give furniture like a coffee table or a sofa a very homely effect. In contrast, pieces of furniture made entirely of metal, such as chairs or shelves, exude their own individual charm. Synthetics were regarded for a long time as a low quality material in furniture production and did not have a good reputation as plastic. The quality and durability of plastic furniture tend to be limited. The established desire for sustainability can gradually be seen in the U.S. in the sales figures for plastic furniture, which have experienced a slight decline since 2015. Sales in the plastic furniture and other furnishing segment in the U.S. are set to total around 3.8 million euros in 2019. Nanotechnologies are opening up a wealth of new opportunities for improving the surface properties of furniture materials. Surfaces are given special properties using nanotechnological coating techniques which make them UV resistant, scratch proof and easy to clean. Home furnishings would be unthinkable today without including the aspect of smart living. Pioneer in the sales market for smart furnishings is the U.S., where sales of $4.6 trillion are being predicted for 2019. Whereas it has been possible to light up rooms for speech control for quite some time now, surfaces are turning more and more into technical marvels nowadays. We can place media anywhere in our physical environment and we can interact with it. That means eventually, I believe, we will go away, moving away from these tablets or, or our smartphones, these little corner things, placing our media content wherever we need it, wherever we want it, fitting to our context. Using media to support our life, make life more beautiful, more nicer, more fresh, more social, have more interaction with people. Decorative materials for furniture and interior design are as indispensable as they are fascinating. The constant change and high development speed pose a challenge to users and designers. Those who want to march with the times should know where the journey is taking them. All my clients who work with that, they talk about natural materials all the time. But I think if I would sort of like point out to the future, it wouldn't surprise me that in maybe two years or three years at this fair, uh, we would have young people who are working with really echo plastics and synthetic materials but which are smart and which work in an environmental way. 
Sustainability and recyclability are the trend topics in furniture manufacture. Upcycling has become much more than just a trend in the meantime. It has become part of a lifestyle where all materials are regarded as valuable. Where things are shared, not bought, and where as little as possible is wasted. I think as a designer it's very important to be curious, to be open-minded, and so it's always a new challenge and it's interesting. I think uh, nowadays we really have to consider to buy good products which become companions for our life. The most important thing is, I think, to, to think really in a sustainable way, in a responsible way, because materials, resources, some of them are ending. The disappearance of raw materials is forcing designers to rethink, allied with a growing interest among consumers in sustainable raw materials. Innovative ways of thinking are required here from designers and interior architects in order to implement the necessary creativity. It is, of course, important when designing furniture or a home interior to establish a very strong contact with the surroundings. It can therefore no longer be the case, in my opinion, that there can be neutralized offers for a piece of furniture to suit all living situations in all towns and cities. Furniture should reflect more regionality because it simply makes sense, it's easy to implement and is ultimately ecological too. Worldwide, it's a central point of contact for families and a culinary hotspot, the kitchen. On average, people spend more than six hours a week cooking here. India leads the field, with Ukraine hot on its heels with over 13 hours, whereas South Koreans are somewhat lazy cooks, with not even four hours spent at the stove. The South Africans, and above all the Italians, bring more experience and passion to the table. Those with less experience gain inspiration from online cooking recipes on smartphones or tablets. 17% of Americans, almost a third of whom are millennials, prefer an online search to cookbooks. Those who prefer a hands-free approach can project cookery videos or people onto surfaces, thus, as we've seen at the Living Kitchen in Cologne, turning the kitchen into a touchpad. The kitchen is a very emotional and social space. Now with our cook date, what we showed, we can connect other people into our kitchen. That means it's almost like you feel somebody's very close to you. It's a different feeling that, than you have it only in your small screen. You have it in a big way. These novelties turn cooking into an experience. Figures show that the market for smart kitchen products is growing steadily. Today's almost 15 billion US dollars is expected to treble to 43 billion by 2027. Right now, intelligent solutions function mostly via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So it's not surprising the kitchen is one of the most popular places for speech services. Alexa, kitchen daylight white. Voice control is absolutely up to date. You can open cupboards with voice control. You can switch on lights, everything essentially. On the other hand, of course, you can order food using voice control. Of all the smart large household appliances, fridges are set to have the second largest market share in 2020 at 28%. Smart solutions which are particularly successful are those where excessive use of the app isn't necessary and the cooking process is simply made easier. And some developments are real problem solvers. One great thing is that they're made for people with disabilities, for old people, especially for those who are wheelchair bound. The fact that they can be moved up and down means they can still be operated when a general standing height does not apply. The goal is to enable people to remain in their own homes, even if they're not as mobile anymore. Kitchens are not only smart at the moment, they're also homely. Open plan kitchens have been popular for years. You can cook and communicate with guests or family at the same time. Because despite our stressful everyday lives, almost 90% of Brits, Americans and Germans attach significance to eating as a family. So the kitchen is a place for cooking, meeting up and communicating. We're becoming more individual, more self-determined. And as a result, we also have different standards when it comes to our homes. We no longer want a housewife's room, previously referred to as the kitchen. We want a fusion of living areas, openness. We also want to live our lifestyle at home. We don't need predefined spaces. What we're after is something more casual and open. 
This openness also makes new concepts possible. This kitchen is variable and can thus be more easily adapted to the user's needs. Homes are getting smaller, but at the same time, lifestyle is becoming more and more significant for those who live in them. Kitchens are different to the way they used to be, a working area where things were put away. I want to have life in my kitchen, I want flexibility. We've got a slogan, merchandising your kitchen. That means we can change our kitchen every day to suit the way we want it. In cities, where living space is reduced, not only are multifunctional solutions conceivable, but also community kitchens. The concept, residents of a house share a kitchen. Sharing, like we have with car sharing, will be definitely a topic in the, in the near future. So we have rooms we share together, and, and when we have rooms just for privacy, for sleeping, but we have definitely rooms, like living rooms or the kitchen, we will share with other people. This is already par for the course in particularly densely populated countries like South Korea. Those who don't share housing are in the minority here. Shared kitchens are also an issue in the country, especially in multi-generation houses. Not, however, to save space, but to spend more time with the family. Another trend in rural areas is outdoor kitchens. Life is shifting more and more outside. We're not just talking about barbecues, it's truly about cooking itself. That feeling of being outdoors with friends, having a pleasant time, or with your family, just spending quality time outdoors. Whether outdoors or indoors, doing things collectively is the key to current kitchen trends, cooking and eating together. And people want to feel good in the process. These days, natural materials create that special feel-good atmosphere, even if just in the form of accessories, as from a practical point of view, kitchens require particularly robust materials. There are more and more different materials available and applicable in the, in the kitchen. No matter whether you are talking about laked fronts, concrete, um, original wood, um, steel, or uh, laminated fronts uh, with anti-fingerprint um, functions, um, there are many different materials available and yeah, it's just a question of individuality which material you like to Im uh, implement in your, in your concrete kitchen planning. So the trend is what you like, supplemented by a few homely, practical and smart solutions that make everyday cooking easier. But most significantly, families and friends around the world will continue to cook, eat and simply spend time together. This crisis has affected and worried people all around the world. The closure of international borders, along with schools and businesses, as well as restrictions on going out in public, has led to millions of people staying at home. No wonder that the house, flat or small apartment is now, more than ever, life's epicenter. While people are bunkering down at home, many industries are suffering as a result of the corona crisis. And this, of course, also affects the furnishing industry. The coronavirus has naturally shaken the entire furniture industry worldwide. Since furniture retail spaces have closed, our main sales channel for furniture has, of course, been closed off. And online retail does not compensate for the shortfall. Because, of course, people need advice when buying pieces of furniture. In addition, furniture is bulky. And that's why furniture retail only works to a very small extent online, because furniture stores are the best way to sell furniture. What's important for consumers when buying furniture also motivates furniture stores worldwide. They are used to getting an overview at trade fairs where you can feel how comfortable the seat is and the material. But the trade fair business has currently ground to a halt worldwide. How is the industry preparing for this? The trade fair industry is currently heavily affected by the coronavirus. However, we are looking forward to when it is all over. In January, the whole industry will meet again in one place in the strongest market in Europe and can really do hands-on business again. However, the corona pandemic has also created a brand new challenge, home office. Before the crisis, only the Netherlands and Finland already had an established home office culture. But that has now changed abruptly. Only a few people are already well prepared for this and have a special place where they can work or even an office. Instead, they must improvise.
dining or coffee table or bed, whatever there is, is being used. Multifunctional, space-saving systems will therefore be in demand for the future, because even after the crisis, the home office will remain a big subject in our digitized world. Digitization makes many of our activities spatially independent, so that we experience work environments, for example, that become more comfortable. The work can take place much more at home, in the cafe or in the park, wherever. And that also changes the requirements that we as planners have to implement in the future. In the future, the boundaries between living and working will be blurred in private and professional life. This means that structural environments have to be as flexible as people. The building is therefore multifunctional and neutral in use. At the same time, more and more people are living in urban areas. In 2019, it was 54% of the world's population. In North America, even 82%. Mega cities, especially in Asia, are being created on the drawing board. This has an impact on the living space. There's not enough space for everybody, meaning if we want to keep living together, which I would think is a quality of city living, of urban living, is there are a bunch of people, diverse people, um, that share space, public space, but meaning the private space will also get smaller and smaller. In the future, not only will gardens or co-working spaces be shared, as is already happening today, but also kitchens or living rooms. The smaller, private living space also alters the demands on the furniture. For Generation Z, large living spaces are not that important. Travel and freedom are priorities. It is also the younger generation that has brought the dominant theme of this century into focus, climate change, with consequences for life itself and how one lives. In the future, we'll have to consider the amount of energy that is used for a product at its full life cycle will be um, a very important factor. And that will, I think, change all the products that we are using. Renewable energy, electromobility, and natural renewable raw materials. At international furniture fairs, increased demand can already be felt today. This reflects social trends and innovations. These are primarily materials that have been used for centuries. As a result, craftsmanship is experiencing a revival. This could be a potential of maybe not only developing something that's super innovative, but at the same time going back to our roots and understanding how we used to do stuff uh, a long time ago maybe, and trying to innovate those know-hows more than actually going and fishing for new materials at all costs. Because sometimes it is good to find these new materials, but how we already have a lot of materials that we work with. And I think just smartly working with those materials is also key to understanding how the future can evolve. iTech will continue to develop and influence our lives in the future, but often in a hidden way. Voice controls and smart home solutions integrate into everyday life rather inconspicuously. Networked houses will be commonplace in 2040. It is crucial for success that the innovative solutions make everyday life easier and are based on human requirements. Smart solutions are particularly popular when they provide comfort, security, or fun. With all these changes, a feel-good atmosphere as a balance to the fast-moving digital world will become a cross-generational topic. Wellness for me is uh, first and foremost. I think uh, in order to live in the future, we need to have environments that support our mental, physical and emotional well-being and community. Corona is showing us that it is these connections that we miss the most. For this reason, the future with all its technical innovations will also make social interaction decisive in our lives. We're living in a globalized world.
In theory, you can get everything you want. Fashion, accessories, and also furniture are being traded worldwide. But does this mean it's all the same thing? Do apartments look alike in Spain, USA, or China? Or do we design our lives more individually than we thought? Jan Becker is an expert on this topic. As an interior designer, he knows his way around home design. And he is also aware that attractive interior design is defined by its differences. Individualität. Individuality. That's basically the key word of interior design. Nobody wants their home to look like their neighbors, and cocooning has become a really big topic these days, which not only manifests itself in the standardized use of materials, but also in using fabrics as a wallpaper. For example, if you use leather not only for your sofa, but if you also start implementing it as a wallpaper. The interior designer from Cologne has clients from all over the world. In New, York, in New York, you see a culture of urbanism going on. And in an urban environment, you want traditional design classics, unique pieces of furniture that support this. But if you then look at the Mediterranean world, you get a different feeling. The lighting is different, and thus colors become very important all of a sudden. This means you might end up with the same piece of furniture, but you dress it up in a different way. And there are also many cultural differences. If, for instance, in India, you do interior design without shades of red, then that's bad karma. National, and in parts also regional differences, stem from culture, climate, history, and several other components. But at the same time, you can also observe similar developments emerging for entirely different reasons. In Norway, Sweden, and Finland, the population is particularly low. Humans are more connected to nature, and this is reflected in the Scandinavian interior design. Minimalistic design meets natural materials like wood and is cozily improved through fur and wool. In Japan, on the other hand, the population is very high. Minimalistic design prevails here based on natural materials like bamboo. Both approaches to interior design meet the current zeitgeist and are equally popular around the world. Once a year, interior styles from all over come together at the IMM in Cologne. International Furniture Fair in Germany with more than 1,200 exhibitors showcasing their products and with over 128,000 visitors from the entire world gathering at the trade fair. The truly international uh, scope of it is, is very exciting because you really reach all, you know, every country and every continent in the world and I think that's giving you the possibility to have exchanges with people from very different cultures. Salespeople, traders, and interior designers like Jan Becker come here for the latest trends. It's all about inspiration and creative exchange. It's not just about furniture, but about the bigger picture, about experiencing home. Barbara, you're the secret weapon when it comes to wholesome living, building up emotions on the way. That's right. So here we have an incredible brand new goat suede leather that you can get in different colors and different finishes. Safe to say that this is bringing an entirely different look to a bed. Also, we have here a cashmere linen fabric. You could easily use that on your bed as a bedspread, or maybe you want to use this for a decorative pillow on the bed or sofa. The same goes for these upholsteries here. A trade fair like the IMM Cologne offers one thing in particular, variety. Variety in design, but also variety in price ranges. Not everyone has large budgets at hand. Generally speaking, the Swiss pay most for furniture and home textiles. Compared to the rest of Europe, here the people spend 36 times more for furniture than in Serbia, the bottom of the European list. Anton von der Lande is visiting IMM Cologne for an online platform for architects and designers. He observes how trends develop and how they become mass market compatible and affordable. At this booth, we're looking at very affordable design in trends that were very visible at the fair three, four, five years ago. For example, we're looking at this beautiful salmon red couch and this gorgeous chair with brass feet. Very affordable nowadays. A couple of years ago, this would have been very expensive. Many of the cheaper alternatives come from China. The Asian country exports the highest amount of furniture in the world, more than three times as much as second and third placed Germany and Italy, who score with an especially high quality in their products. They export into the entire world, with the US being their main customers, Germany as a second. 
The worldwide design range is huge. You don't have to design a furniture that fits everywhere. No, you design it for a certain customer. There will still be you know, villa designs, there will still be big apartments, um, and there will be furniture for that as well. Look at hotels. Hotels are the laboratories of living. Hotel trends, you know, a couple of years later become residential trends. Places like hotels, markets, or fairs are here to inspire, just like this sofa demonstrates. Auf der Möbelmesse gesehen, we saw this at the IMM Cologne and fell in love with it, this piece in its circular shape. We took the liberty of adjusting its color to our needs. After all, individuality is what really counts these days. And in the end, we want to establish trends or spark an impulse reaction in our customers to inspire them on how they could design their own homes. So these days, living arrangements root in a cultural mixture and individuality. They're not restricted to country borders either and can expand internationally or establish themselves over time. Until these trends reach the average customer, it usually takes a while. But trade fairs like IMM and interior designers like Jan Becker help picking up on these trends and spreading them faster.